She listens. Listens. Holding her breath. Surely that voice is his. The one who looked at her once across the crowd as no one had ever looked. Had seen her. Had spoken <coughs> to her. Surely these hands were his. Taking a pot of bread from her just now. Hands he laid them to die and made them well. Surely that face, the man who crucified for sedition and blasphemy, the man whose body disappeared from the tomb, the man who was rumored now some women had seen this morning alive. Those who brought the stranger home to, to their table don't recognize yet with whom they sit. The she in the kitchen, absolutely touching the wine jug she's to take care. A young black servant intently listening. Swings around and sees the light around her and is sure. Lemotov's poem is a meditation on a painting about 400 years earlier, uh, made in 1620 by Diego Velazquez, considered the most influential portrait artist in Spanish history. This piece is actually his earliest known work, and I hope all of you received a copy of it for service leave. One critic writes of it, the woman is distracted. In her left hand, she holds a ceramic jar of wine. She's glancing over her right shoulder, listening carefully to the back room conversation. She bends over to support herself. The stunned expression on her face indicates that her eavesdropping has confirmed her suspicions. She's in a state of shock, having recognized the man she's serving. There are actually two versions of this painting. One of, our, one of the artists here in Chicago features the kitchen maid alone, while the other, the National Gallery of Ireland, has is this one. It has its background with two figures around the dinner table, as well as the outstretched arm of their third companion. For a long period after this piece was painted, the background scene was obscured by grime and accumulated over time, so that only the main subject, the maid, was visible. Then when it was in 1933, the background scene came into focus. And we can see, once again, Jesus with Cleopas and his companion after their walk to Emmaus. There is no mention in the Gospel of the Kitchen Maid, but it's very likely that someone else, besides the journey of them, cooked their meal, considering the late hour at which they arrived. And it's highly likely that this person would have been a woman given the time and place. That Velasquez chose to make her a different ethnicity from the others was intentional. In fact, we can see based on the clothing that Velasquez uh, chose to make the scene contemporary with his own time. And while Jesus' companions are depicted as Spaniards, Velasquez called the maid La Mulata, the Mulato, and she is a Moor a person of African and Muslim descent. In the early part of the 17th century, in Velasquez's time, it had been over a century since Moorish rule over a part of Spain had been overthrown. The Moors who remained in the country in the United Catholic rule of Spain had experienced a dramatic reversal of fortunes. Once they had been leaders, not only in government, but also in the fields of the arts and sciences, of architecture and engineering. But a hundred years later, one commentator writes that the Spanish of the day considered wars to be lazy and figuratively subhuman. Sadly, this is all too often how the powerful think of the powerless in every society, especially if they are considered other from the majority culture. The subject of this painting, then, is a person marginalized at every level. Race, religion, gender, class. While the men speak of spiritual matters in the back, she hard at work in the kitchen. One commentator writes, with this painting, Velasquez takes his stand on raging debate in Spain during his time. Whether Spain, as a Christian country, had a right to enslave the indigenous of the New World and to enslave Africans. Through his kitchen maid, with the supper at Emmaus, Velasquez declares that enslaved people of African descent had immortal souls and have ears to hear Christ's word. There's no moral justification for their enslavement. 
and if by destruction they be enslaved, they yet have souls. Indeed, their lowly state in society makes them look at the word of Christ and even Christ's own disciples. Today is the third Sunday of our Easter season, and today's gospel reading is the continuation of Luke's version of the resurrection story. Right before Cleopas and his companion were met by Jesus on the road to Emmaus, Mary Magdalene, Mary the mother of James, Joanna, and the other unnamed women saw the empty tomb and heard the angels announce Jesus' resurrection. But when the women went to tell the apostles, it seemed to them an idle tale. It seemed like nonsense to all these men except Peter, who went back to look at the tomb. When the story picks up today, Cleopas and his companion have heard the women's report of the empty tomb and that Jesus is alive. But they seem to have had a very normal reaction of not believing in this miracle. They're sad when they begin to recount the story to the stranger in the metal road, somehow unrecognizable to them as their teacher, Jesus. After hearing the story, they're dashed hopes and they're astonished at the women's report of the resurrection. Jesus scolds them for not understanding what the prophets had to say about the Messiah. They said, we hoped that he was the one to redeem Israel, suggesting they thought Jesus was going to bring a political and military victory over the Roman occupation. But Jesus says, no, was it not necessary that the Messiah should suffer these things and then turn to his glory? The Messiah, Jesus says, must suffer and die to bring salvation. The resurrection could not happen without the crucifixion. Jesus was a different kind of king than everyone had expected. He was a king who came to serve, not to reign in majesty. Indeed, he was a suffering servant, as imagined by the prophet Isaiah. But even after Jesus appeared to Cleopas and his companion, even after he debated theology with them and opened the scriptures to them, they still did not recognize him. After they arrived at the destination of Emmaus, he seems ready to part ways with them, but they give him an invitation. Stay with us, for it is almost evening, and the day is now nearly over. They offer him hospitality in, through a meal and through a place to sleep, because it probably would have been dangerous to keep walking on the road as the night approached. Perhaps they also appreciated his company in a sad and confusing time. And perhaps they were also inspired by his confidence that everything was happening for a reason. At the meal, when Jesus takes the bread, blesses it, breaks it, and gives it to them, their eyes are finally opened, and they recognize him before he then mysteriously vanishes from sight. Jesus' actions at the table of Emmaus are the same ones he performed at the Last Supper. They are, in fact, the Christian church's model for the Eucharist. Take, bless, break, and give. When we celebrate Holy Communion, the priest on behalf of the congregation takes bread, blesses it, breaks it, and then gives it to the gathering assembly. Just as Christ revealed himself to his followers at the dinner table, Jesus makes himself known to us in the breaking of the bread. We experience the presence of Christ in the bread and wine of the Eucharist as we are joined together in this body of Christ. What exactly does it mean to be joined in the body of Christ? St. Augustine, writing about the story of the walk to Emmaus, had some insight. The teacher was walking with them along the way, and he himself was the way. And because they observed hospitality, him, who they knew not yet, in the expounding of scriptures, they suddenly know in the breaking of bread. Augustine, one of the great theologians of the church, puts the primary revelation of God not in scripture, important as that is, but in the practice of faith, in the continuing action 
of participating in Christ's mission, exemplified by Cleopas and his companion offering hospitality to Jesus, and by also continuing that sacred meal that Jesus told his disciples to do in his name. We know Jesus in the breaking of the bread, not just in the Eucharist, but every time we feed one another, serve one another, share with one another, and join in solidarity with one another. Diego Velasquez was exactly right in depicting the servant and social outcast as a witness to the resurrection, as an apostle. Jesus came to break down barriers, lift up those societies left behind, and serve those in need. And that is the mission to which he calls us. That is what we are doing today in baptism for Little River. We are saying to River, join us in Christ's mission to heal the world, to break down all of these barriers, and to lift up those cast down. Writing from the Christian century several years ago, Pastor Beth Shaw, inspired by this painting, suggests a post-Easter activity for us all. Take an Emmaus walk through the neighborhood where you live, the neighborhood surrounding your church, or another corner of town if you'd like to explore with new eyes. As you walk, look for signs of hope and new life, and reflect on how Christ is present or hidden in that place. In 17th century Catholic Spain, a servant girl of African and Muslim descent, considered the lowest in society, was transfigured through art into one of the first evangelists, a bearer of the good news of the resurrection and God's salvation to the world. The good news that God's love is for everyone. Diego Velasquez is seen in a man such remarkable because it puts a marginalized, overlooked figure at the forefront, one though who draws our attention to the small, haloed figure of the Savior of the world. In the background. We see Christ through her eyes. If Velasquez lived and painted today, here in the 21st century, here in the United States, here in Asbury Park, New Jersey, who would be the kitchen maid? Who would be the witness? Who would represent Christ, the risen Christ, made manifest in the outcast and the socially downtrodden? Who would be a sign? of new life and God's unconditional love for us all. She listens, listens, holding her breath. Surely that voice is his, the one who looked at her across the crowd as no one ever looked, had seen her, had spoken as if to her. Those who brought the stranger home to their table don't recognize yet with whom they sit, but she in the kitchen swings around and sees the light around her and is sure. O oh God, whose blessed Son made himself known to the disciples in the breaking of bread, open the eyes of our faith, that we may behold him in all his redeeming work, who lives and reigns with you, in the unity of the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen.